So good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome on this fireside chat of the Good AI about AI and biodiversity. Uh, we're really happy to have you all joining. And I'm also super happy to have our panel of great speakers with us, Zoe Limwood, Emily, and Filippo. Uh, first of all, I'm going to talk a bit about the Good AI and share a few slides. Uh, let me do this very briefly. Here we go. Here we are. Perfect. So, um, what is behind the Good AI? Uh, so, a few words about, about myself. So, I've been working in the tech industry for the last 10 years I've been working in software companies, I've been working in the VC industry with hardware startups, but I was always looking for a way to join uh, impact and uh, in tech and I, I couldn't really find it uh, until uh, a time when I got the opportunity to start working uh, in an AI startup back in 2018. And I was really amazed by the the power of this technology. And I always give this example, um, basically, of um, to, to illustrate the power of AI. I give the example of AlphaFold. So maybe some of you are familiar with this uh, deep learning program that was launched by DeepMind last year. And so basically what DeepMind managed to do, thanks to AI, is to uh, you know, solve one of the biggest challenges bio in biology, is to predict the shape of protein. Um, uh, you may know that there are billions of uh, protein and each of them have a unique shape. So by be, the, the half a foot program, it's able to predict with the same level of accuracy. I may have some of the speakers to go mute because there is some noise. If you can go mute, that'd be super cool. That's excellent. Thank you. So, uh, well, there's still some noise. Maybe it's going good, Filippo or, or Emily. Can you maybe go mute? Excellent. So, um, AlphaFold basically um, is able to predict the shape of a protein in a, in a matter of, of days versus years, the same level of accuracy that, than conventional conventional lab. So basically, they are opening the door to new treatment for for this disease and, and a lot of like new synthetic proteins. Uh, that that's another topic. But just to show you the power of AI, basically, it's able to solve. Uh, problems and find solution that we human beings are totally unable to to provide and and when i was so discovering this fantastic world of ai this was exactly when the united nations um, uh, were starting to announce that we were falling behind with regards to achieve um, um, the sustainable development goals by 2030 uh, so you may be familiar with the sustainable development goals there are 17 um, goals adopted by the United Nations back in 2015 uh, as a universal call basically to end poverty, protect the planet and, and have pe people live in peace and prosperity by, by 2030. And so when they were explaining that we were falling behind and, and, and I was at the same time experiencing this wow uh, effect with AI, I just in my head, I'm just like, oh, but we must be able in, to achieve these, um, these goals and AI definitely is going to be a leverage to to achieve these goals. I was I was really convinced, and I was so convinced that I've decided to turn this into my job, uh, and and to create the good AI. So basically, uh, today the, the mission of the good AI is to um, uh, spot organization, entrepreneurs, uh, researchers that are using AI to uh, to help deliver on sustainable development goals, and to help them. Uh, accelerate to help, to help them grow. Um, so we, we're still very young. We, we started at uh, end of 2020, but we already have 250 organizations. We're growing, uh, well, this is an even younger project, but we're also growing a team of individual, of talents. Uh, we have 150 of them. We have a team of writers that are writing about how AI can empower us, help us take the, the best decision. And so basically, we're trying to um, bring, uh, you know, um, uh, advantages and to help our, our members grow fast 
through visibility. So uh, you can check our, our website, thegoodai.co. You'll see some information about all of these members. We're trying to help them recruit, find the best talents. We're going to try as well, going further into the year, to enable collaboration between our members, um, provide business opportunities, access to VC, corporate ventures. So a lot of different, like a nice ecosystem that we're trying to build around our community member, trying to be basically this super, uh, this super connector. So this is this was a few words about really my 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 my, my journey with AI and how we we've, we've started um, uh, the good AI. And so um, every month, well, basically I forgot to say that. So if you have if yourself you have um, uh, you have a company, you have a startup or yourself uh, are a talented a PhD using AI or studying AI, feel free to go on the good AI and to apply to join the community. And so every month we're hosting a fireside chat uh, with some of our members. And uh, today is a very special one because uh, when I remember when I was little, I, I was dreaming to, to be a vet and to, to live like in, in Kenya or Rwanda. And uh, I remember I had this book when I was 14 years old with all these women working with animals. And when uh, I read about the profile of Zoe, I was like, oh my God, <laughs> I could have been her. So uh, it's even super emotional for me to host uh, uh, Zoe and to host uh, the other uh, speakers because uh, protecting wildlife, protecting biodiversity has always been very uh, key for me. And I, I'm, I, like, I'm the happiest woman today to be able to you know, bring on the same table my work uh, in the tech industry, uh, AI people and those important, super important missions to protect um, our biodiversity, to protect endangered species, and to build as well, you know, to, to build more education around the necessity to protect um, all this beautiful uh, uh, world we have um, among us. So, uh, if we come back on the sustainable development goals, uh, just to give you a, a few ideas, uh, a few notions of the goals when it comes to protecting uh, biodiversity, either on land or below water. So here you have, uh, I've selected four of them, but they are way more. Uh, and so as you can see, the first one, 15.5. So we need to um, uh, protect and reduce the degradation of natural habitats, halt the loss of biodiversity, um, uh, by 2020. So as you know, we super light, protect and prevent uh, extinction of, of threatened, threatened species. Uh, so we'll see with, uh, with Zoe and, and uh, Emily how we can use AI to, to do this, exact, to exactly do this. Uh, control, prevent, poaching, trafficking, uh, also by educating local communities. This is super, super key. And with the technology that Zoe is providing, for instance, with WorldTract, we can enable this. Uh, also, with the, um, the little uh, the little playbook of Filippo, you see, we can also learn to we can um, teach younger generation uh, about wildlife and, and and why they should be protected. Uh, going further, also for everything related to life below water. Uh, some of the goals are to increase the scientific knowledge, re um, develop research capacity. Uh, transfer marine technology. So we'll see this also with Linwood, who is doing an, an amazing job at the cent Center for the Fourth Revolution and the Open uh, Data Platform. And, um, and, and, and we can also discuss all those topics relating to um, uh, illegal fishing, so how we can reduce it, how we can uh, regulate uh, those, um, the, this, um, this phenomenon and protect as well the, all the, the the, the, the fish world uh, um, below the water. <laughs> so uh, without waiting, I'm gonna uh, ask or um, I'm gonna ask our speaker to introduce themselves and I'm gonna come back here. Here I am, I couldn't see you guys. Uh, but I will, I'm gonna ask all of, our, um, all of our speakers to introduce themselves briefly. Um, let's take five minutes for, for each of you. And then uh, after this, you'll be able to talk to each other. Uh, and it's gonna be super interesting because while we were in the, in the in backstage, I could hear all the speakers. They were also already starting to question themselves, etc. So I had to 
ask them just just wait to be on live so you can talk and we can all um, enjoy uh, your conversation. So um, let's uh, let's start with Zoe. So Zoe uh, Duel, you're the president of Fright Track and uh, potentially one of my heroes today. <laughs> so uh, you can unmute yourself and uh, uh, we'll be super happy to, to, to know a bit about you. So you were a vet initially. So how did you, what have been your journey from being a vet to today developing uh, the technology you're gonna talk about us, which is basically a non-invasive footprint uh, tracking system for endangered species. Thank you. Thank you, Caroline, for that great introduction. I'm honoured to be here today. Um, I should stay right at the outset. I'm just half of Wild Track, um, the other half. Um, my husband and co-partner, um, co-founder of Wild Track, Sky Alibi, um, and I, we worked together um, for many, many years, decades, in fact. That's a bit scary. Um, basically, it started a long time ago. As you say, I was, I was actually newly qualified as a vet. Um, and I was given the opportunity to go and work in Africa with Sky's Monitor Rhino. And I thought, well, this would be a nice sabbatical. You know, I'm not going to get an opportunity like this again. So um, off we went and um, started working with the Zimbabwean government to monitor black rhino. Um, and um, basically that took us along a whole new path that we didn't expect. We never went back to our respective careers. He gave up um, a perfectly good career, tenured position at London University, and I never went back to vetting because we discovered something which we felt was more interesting. Um, we monitored these black rhino for 10 years. We went out every day tracking them. They had radio collars on. Um, and to our surprise, the data that we were collecting showed that the regular immobilization of these rhinos um, for recollaring and for checking the equipment, all the things you have to do when you put a collar around the rhino's neck, um, was having a negative impact on their fertility. So the females were actually producing fewer calves, um, and it really wasn't the outcome we wanted to see. So around about that same time, we were out every day tracking with indigenous expert trackers. And we learned how to track. We learned about footprints. Um, and when we would go out into the bush waving a, a radio antenna to try and find the rhino, they would kind of laugh at us and say, all the data you need is on the ground in front of you. So we started to look at footprints a bit more seriously. Um, and we slowly developed a technique. It did take some time. Try, we first of all started tracing footprints on the ground with acetate sheets and we didn't get the results we wanted, but we kept going, refining the technique. And eventually we developed this footprint identification technique, which can identify species, individual, sex or age class from footprints. We then expanded that to lots of other species. So now we have a whole range of species that we work with. Um, and recently we started using AI as part of this process. Um, the, the original FIT was basically more for metrics, which is taking measurements from the footprint, put it through a statistical program that we developed. And we would get the output, which was fantastic. But the problem with that is the more data we started getting in, the harder it was to keep track of all that data and process it because each footprint took a minute or two to process. So we needed something faster. We needed something that could engage more people to help us collect data. And so AI was the natural fit for that. And last year, we were lucky enough to run into a fantastic team of engineers at UC Berkeley um, in the States where we're based. Um, and they helped us actually develop an AI pipeline. So now we have a system where people can take footprints with their phones anywhere in the world. And this is one of the big things we're trying to encourage. The data goes up to our cloud. The cloud processes the footprint, give, tells us the species. At the moment, it's got very high species accuracy. We're working on the others. Um, and they're coming on as the data comes in. But ultimately, we'll have that system feedback and give the person on the ground an instant identification of that footprint. Um, so it's really going to, I think AI is really going to democratize what we do in the sense that it'll enable everybody to participate, not just professional biologists. Um, and it'll allow us to process the data much faster, which means that we'll be able to start putting landmark points on the map, the map of the world, about where these species are and how many there are. Um, and that will really allow us to, I mean, those two things, where are species and how many are there, those are the two like kind of fundamental building blocks for conservation biology. 
we just don't have enough of that data at the moment. So we're hoping this technique will really allow us to push forward and drive the kind of conservation strategies that the world needs to put in place. I've talked too much already. You've probably got some questions. No, 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 no. And uh, that, that's super exciting. And I was wondering, like, what is your, like, what is the next big step for you? What do you need to accelerate? Um, like, for instance, for the next, next 12 months, what, what is your goal? So now that you are now that you are AI powered, because it's pretty right. recent, right? It was from last year. Yeah, absolutely. It's hot off the press. So our next move mm -hmm. is to bring in more data. We need more help from more um, AI scientists and engineers um, to develop our pipeline. We've already got some great help from Microsoft and their team, um, and from our personal team of helpers. Um, but you know, I think the same for everybody in the AI field. More data more democratization, bring everybody in. It helps create awareness. We've now got around 10,000 footprints in our database. We want to reach 100,000 by the end of the year. Um, you know, it's, it's the first part is kind of the slow part. Now we've got all the machine parts working, the data can come in. So lots of exciting, um, I guess, um, targets to meet. All right, super. Thank you, Zoe. We'll have, I think, a lot of questions for you just after uh, the other uh, did introduce themselves. Thank You're you very, very much. Welcome. You're very welcome. And uh, now let's uh, talk with Lynn Wood. So, hi, Lynn Wood. I'm going to bring Zoe. Perfect. So, you're the senior uh, vice president of science at the center of the fourth revolution, Oceans. Um, and you're also working on this very exciting project, the Ocean Data Platform. So really happy to have a bit more about you. But before, what, what were you doing before? What is your journey? Like, what is your well, background? You know, I started off really trying to understand what would be the impacts of climate change on ocean biodiversity and people. And um, what I found was that while we have a lot of data, it's not enough. And that really sounds kind of strange. But, you know, if you think about the fact that, the, for instance, the World Ocean Database is this incredible database of ocean data has more than three and a half billion measurements. So I thought, okay, that's a really good place to start. But the ocean is big. I mean, it's, it's really big. It's 1.35 billion square kilometers, not liters, square kilometers. You can't even imagine how big that is. So no matter how much data you think you have, when you divide it by 1.35 billion cubic kilometers, um, the amount of data you have for any particular part of the ocean is really pretty small. And as I started digging deeper into this, what I began to discover is that it's not that we don't have data, it's just that we don't have data all in one place. And so if you think about the fact that there are 150 ocean countries out there, and there are 83 countries that have more ocean than land when you look at their EECs. Um, fewer than 30 currently share data on a regular basis with the World Ocean Database. So there's this data out there, it's stuck in countries. Um, you know, there's a, a lot of data about ocean biodiversity in, in Flickr in, images and Instagram and, and Pinterest, and people really haven't been doing a good job of pulling that data into a place like the World Ocean Database or the Ocean Biogeographic Information System. Industry's got tons of data. And um, if you wanna do the kind of analysis that we need to do to use deep learning and AI techniques to really understand how climate change is affecting biodiversity, you've gotta get all of these data together. And to do AI, you, you need both big data you know, so high volume, high velocity, high variation, um, but broad data. So many different kinds of data so you can make sense of what you're doing. And I've been working with whales, for instance, and trying to find beluga whales. And Emily will talk more about this. But you need environmental data and, and observational data to make sure that if you're looking at satellite images, you're not mistaking a beluga whale for a little iceberg. So... I was really trying to find a way of getting all of these different kinds of data about the ocean, ocean variables and environmental variables, biodiversity and people in one place. And that turns out that's exactly what the ocean data platform was trying to do. And the ocean data platform was just being created. So 
I ended up doing a secondment. I was at the time the um, global lead for ocean science at World Wildlife Fund. I did a secondment with the Ocean Data Platform to try to help them start building that platform, um, thinking about biodiversity in my mind, but really th that Ocean Data Platform grew and is growing to become a place where you can find AI ready data for the global ocean that's fused together. So these data are often what we call interoperable. They're collected at different times, slightly different places. Um, we're working with something called Cognite Data Fusion to make all these non-like data come together so then people can start building apps and doing AI right on top of that. But as we started doing this, um, we really found out that it's not enough just to have the data in one place. It's making sure that people have the wherewithal to use these data. And so the Ocean Data Platform eventually grew into the Center for the Fourth Industrial Revolution for the Ocean, which is really focused on making those connections between the technology and people. And so we are really interested in understanding what we need to do so when people create AI kinds of applications, people will use it. And so um, we found that trust is a big deal. Uh, if people don't trust the AI and they don't trust the data, they're not going to use it. We found that um, it's very, sometimes can be quite challenging to take big sets of data and use AI to distill it into tools that people can use. So we've been working with the Norwegian um, National University for Science and Technology and the World Economic Forum to really try to understand what are the factors that affect whether people trust data, big data in AI. Um, we've been working with Global Fishing Watch to understand how you use AI to estimate risks in fisheries, and then ultimately transmit that to people into tools that they can use to assess um, risk when they go to the grocery store and try to buy fish. So can really, you, can you, uh, yeah. Can you share an example with um, the global uh, uh, fish, um, fish organization, like a concrete example of the use of data they, they, they do? Well, so, so Global Fishing Watch has on its website um, data for tens of thousands of fishing vessels, point data, um, their position uh, every few seconds, really, um, every few minutes. And they can use that data to look for behavior in fishing vessels that may indicate, say, illegal behavior. But that is, you know, if you have, say, 60,000 fishing boats and you have point location data that's being generated all the time, you're talking about hundreds of thousands of data points a day that you have to analyze. And so they've been analyzing that kind of information to see when fishing vessels are behaving in strange ways that may indicate that they're offloading fish illegally or transferring fish and things like that. Um, but you have to be able to connect that behavior back to the individual fishing vessel so you can trace the, the impact of that behavior ultimately to the grocery store. So there's lots of things that have to happen. Um, and so how do you figure out how do you take all that AI generated information and knowledge and give it to the consumer in a way that makes them feel confident that the fish they're buying um, did not come from a fishing vessel that was participating in illegal activities, for instance. But, you know, this applies to everything. If people don't trust the data and understand the data um, that's produced by AI, then how are we going to use that to protect biodiversity? And when you come to trust and transparency, are you what do you what kind of um, initiative are you putting in place within the? So Ocean we have, uh, yeah. So we have a a grant um, through the World Economic Forum. Uh, that's the, the the grant is called the Hoffman Fellowship. It's funded by Andre Hoffman, and that allows us to have a postdoc postdoctoral um, researcher who's going to work with us in the Norwegian Technical um, and Science University, National Science and Technical University, to really start working with stakeholders and really understanding what are their needs, and then how can we make sure that we're giving them the data and the big data analysis that they need and they feel comfortable with to make decisions about the fishery. 
Um, and it could include aquaculture. So we're just starting, that will begin this summer, but really it's part of what the, the UN Decade of Ocean Science refers to as, as co-creating science. And in this case, we're trying to co-create the data and the AI that regulators need. So we give them information that they can act on. A lot of times in science, we create science and then the regulator is you know, left puzzling over what am I gonna do with this data and how do I interpret these data? And when we add AI to that um, mix, it becomes even more uh, confusing for regulators if we don't start by talking to the regulators first. You're still muted, Carolyn. Yeah, I'm still mute. Oh, sorry. So I was saying thank you very much, Inwood, and looking forward to, to see the next steps uh, with this program and, and following the grant you you receive. Congrats on this. Um, now we're gonna have Emily. Emily um, Charitissier, who is the CEO of Whale Seekers. Um, so hi, Emily. Thanks for, for joining hi. us. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so why the whales? What, what, was, what is your story? How did you sure. end up uh, starting Whale Seeker? Out of frustration. <laughs> so so I'm, I'm an ecologist by training and my husband is a marine biologist. And we had the opportunity to work together on a WWF Arctic Species Grant. Uh, and it was taking the work that my husband had done looking at demographic information on narwhals using aerial imagery to, to understand the, you know, the, the health of the populations better. So, you know, males, females, babies, and to see, are these populations doing well? How are they using their habitat? So much more than just a total count. And the, the grant that we got was to expand on this work that he had already started. And it was analyzing by hand thousands and thousands of aerial images. And you don't need to do 6,000 before you think to yourself, there must be a better way to do this. Um, and so, so we looked for ways to maybe automate this or at least get rid of the images that don't have anything, just something to help us because each image takes between, I guess, 30 seconds if there's nothing in there to see or up to a half an hour if there are a lot of whales and it's tricky if there's ice, if there are white caps. So it's really time consuming when you're processing aerial images, you, you, you can't just have anybody do it. Person needs to be um, you know, educated in this field. And then you don't get the the results right away. So so we thought, gosh, there needs to be, be a way to do this much quicker, so that decision makers and people who need this information get the get the information as soon as possible. And there must be a way to at least speed up this process or standardize it in some way. And what we found was that there were tech companies that were willing to create a bespoke solution but we couldn't even get them on the phone if we couldn't guarantee them a mid six figure contract. And, you know, we were working for the WWF. Uh, I mean, this was not, uh, this was not in the realm of our possibilities. And as we spoke with other biologists in our community, we saw that this was, there was the same bottleneck in lots of different industries and in shipping, oil and gas, conservation, government, um, environmental consulting, they all had the same problem of needing to detect whales more quickly from remote sensed images uh, accessibly. So we thought, okay, well, we'll just, uh, we'll do it ourselves. We thought, um, you know, AI is everywhere. How, how hard can it be? We're, you know, we're, very good at statistics. We've done programming. Um, turns out pretty tricky. And I had a hard time. We knew we needed a, a technical co-founder. And I had a really hard time breaking into that community, even though we're located in Montreal, which is an AI hub. There's all this talk about interdisciplinary use and how can AI be applied to other industries. And I found that it was it was a pretty hard group to to tap into. Luckily, I I met someone at the dog park who happened to be 
a programmer and was very interested in this. So we, he, he and I spoke for a while and then he, d he decided that he was very interested in this. So he jumped ship. He became our third co-founder. Co He's our CTO now. And we were, we were off and running. And what's, what's really interesting about this problem of detecting whales or marine mammals in the water is that the task varies from just detecting movement or shadows that maybe uh, you know land animal detection is is based off of, whether it's aerial images or satellite imagery, because the 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 water's moving as well, so everything is dynamic. And and we spoke with people who had already tried or hired a company to solve this problem and say, you know, can you detect whales and images? The tech company says, yes, we will detect 100% of the whales in your images, but their solution also detects 100% of white caps on the water and ice and pelicans and boats and buoys and everything else. So, so there was this disconnect between what the, the technical job was to do and the use for it. And so where, where whale seeker is unique as well is that we've got the domain experts and the technical experts under one roof and we can really focus on this one problem. Um, it's very, it's very nuanced. And as um, you know, image, method image acquisition methods are always evolving getting better and better and more and more accessible same with ai it's becoming more and more powerful there's there's new ways to 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 solve problems all the time you know we really need a dedicated tech team merged with a, a biology team to make sure that whatever we're creating is is useful and serving its purpose and isn't just power for for power's sake so yeah, that's that's how that's how we created Whale Seeker, and um, yeah, what uh, what questions do you have? <laughs> Thank you very much, Emily. I'm seeing time, so we're gonna okay. we're gonna finish the presentation with Filippo, and then we'll get back to the question perfect. because I'm sure we have plenty perfect, of for you. Thank you, Filippo. Uh, is coming on stage. I'm here. Hi, Filippo. Hi. Hey. So, Filippo. It's it's interesting because we got to talk. We we talked to each other yesterday for the first time. We haven't been in touch in a previous life when we were talking hardware. <laughs> and by 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 chance, uh, Filippo mentioned that he was working on this um, biodiversity Pokebox. Pokedex. And there was Pokedex. Pokedex. I'll put a link to, in the chat so people can look at it. Yeah. So maybe you guys remember Pokemon. You're not seeing the link, but <laughs> but uh, but actually, um, uh, you're going to tell us more about about this uh, this Pokedex. But uh, it, I thought it was it was great to have you join this um, this very chat because protecting biodiversity through AI also goes through the education of the young of our younger people that will tomorrow will be the guardian of all this of this wildlife. And and Filippo has really leverage on his creative. Uh, uh design background to create something which i think can be potentially super powerful and and that you'll be able to offer to your kids for christmas so filippo um please uh, let us know a bit about you your background and how you um mixing uh, design uh, tech and impact on a daily basis sure uh so thank you so much for the other uh panelists uh for uh, uh, for being part of this as well. And uh, my name is Filippo Jacob. I am a designer and an entrepreneur. And today I uh, run a product studio called Fin. And we're doing things that may sound madness to some. We're teaching our jellyfish over there uh, how to write poetry with machine learning. We have a chair behind me that can think and learn uh, just like a human. And uh, we're developing a space program for kids. And uh, I guess you would say that uh, uh, my background is that of a creative technologist, maybe. Uh, but for the last seven years, uh, I've been a kid tech entrepreneur. We created a product called the Cubetto Playset, which was a tangible programming language for kids ages three and up. 
uh, Pigsby, which was a, uh, a digital, physical uh, crypto piggy bank uh, for kids. And uh, really how I came into the topic of not just AI, but biodiversity as well, uh, was um, sort of at the start of this year, at the end of last year, I had to uh, close my companies uh, and sell them. And, uh, and I started again from scratch with uh, Finn. And the goal was just to have a little bit of fun after uh, seven long years and, and pick up some new technologies uh, that are complicated and see if I could make something fun with it for learning and play uh, from my passion uh, of kid tech. And so I teamed up with my uh, uh, studio colleague, Alexis, and uh, with a, a PhD student uh, in machine learning uh, called Joe Brown uh, from Oxford. And uh, we sort of came together and we had this idea of um, building a real life Pokedex. And I think that's the best way to describe it if people have ever played Pokemon. And the Pokedex is this wonderful device that uh, Ash in the world of Pokemon gets given uh, by Professor Oak, who is this character in the storyline that calls him to adventure. And the Pokedex is a digital encyclopedia that contains all of the information of all the Pokemon in the world of Pokemon. And it's, uh, it has this wonderful interaction in the fictional storyline of uh, entry on discovery. So Ash goes around the world of Pokemon, he finds these Pokemon, uh, he takes pictures of them, and he collects data about these Pokemon, and uh, uh, kind of like a collectible cards in a way. And uh, I think Alexis came in one day and said, uh, wouldn't it be fun if we just made a real life Pokemon with real animals instead of, you know, fictional characters? And, uh, and that's kind of how it rolled. And we sort of said, yeah, let's do it. And uh, at the time, uh, I had come across this really interesting technology. Uh, I'm not paid by Google. I'll just uh, disclaimer that. But uh, uh, the Coral platform. And uh, they have this wonderful product called the DevBoard uh, Mini, which is this uh, super accessible uh, piece of hardware uh, that uh, fundamentally allowed us to run uh, TensorFlow on it and, uh, and to really create an object, which is this, that kids can use to go around in the real world and take pictures of the animals that they find and uh, create uh, and what happens is that the AI magically takes those pictures, uh, recognizes what the insect or what the dog or what the plant is, and creates a fact card that goes inside your uh, Pokedex. And uh, uh, so really that was kind of the inspiration, is making a real world Pokedex. But um, as we started then doing a lot of research around it, we sort of understood that you know, there are more than a million species in the world that are in danger of extinction. And uh, the ecology education does not keep up with ecology degradation. And uh, we just cannot protect uh, what we don't know. And uh, so how do we create a system in which we get live feedback uh, on the species that surround us, the flora and the fauna, and its health? And, uh, uh, and, and we, we just thought AI was, was the perfect use for it and it, it is what allowed us to, cre to, to, to create this prototype and this product. And so uh, and that's kind of how we fell into the AI rabbit hole and then uh, more so learning about biodiversity. And uh, uh, it, it's really through education and also beyond education and child's play is about uh, having a system that can uh, continuously curate the data sets available on our surrounding natural world, whether it's you know, in an urban jungle or in an actual jungle, as we say in the video. And, uh, uh, and how can we harness the power of play and of education in a device that really pushes that forward uh, for, for the good of science? So it's about education, but it's also about moving forward uh, the topic of, of getting this information and making the data sets available to us and the models better that we all rely on, whether it's Zoe um, or, uh, or Emily or Linwood, we, we, all need, uh, we all need better data sets to work with uh, because uh, 
I think I heard it from a panel a few weeks ago. Somebody said AI is is basically it's all about the data that you can gather. You know, it's uh, garbage in, garbage out, quality in, quality out, and uh, and really that's how we're kind of connecting all of the dots. So uh, that's us in a nutshell. Thank you so much, Filippo. I'm the, I'm gonna call everyone uh, back on the stage and uh, now super happy but to, to leave you page basically i'm sure you guys have questions for each other so we're gonna have this for the next uh, 15 minutes maybe a bit more and then we'll we'll answer the question of, uh, of the audience i can see that we have already some so who wants to start you know we'll go ahead i, I just I want to make a comment, not a question, which is you know, the four of us um, that you've invited here, I don't think we've ever met before we did our little rehearsal. But I can already see ways that if we were all working together, sharing data like Filippo mentioned, all of our work would be a lot more impactful. So for instance, Emily was talking about, well, she had that one tech company that was identifying everything in her image. Well, you know, there are people that need to know about all those other things that Emily doesn't care about. If we could get all of those people sharing that one image, we could afford to buy a lot more images. But to really make sense of it, as Emily was saying, you need verification of what you're seeing. And so you take something like um, Finn's product, and if we could connect that to people who are doing images. So when people go on whale watching tours, or if you could take this underwater, then we could combine that with all the imagery data that we have of, of satellites looking at the sea or people taking pictures underwater. And we could really start identifying this information. And the same thing is true with elephants and rhinos. We can see them from space, but sometimes we don't know what they are. But if your tracking information were somehow brought together in one place, um, we would be able to enable AI. So it really just shows you the power of bringing all this together is what's really going to set AI free, I think. I agree with that, Linwood. And I would add, um, you know, when we started along this AI path, I thought the biggest challenge would be getting the data. Um, and while that remains partly true. Um, I think an even bigger challenge is annotating and curating the data. And Emily um, alluded to that, and we've experienced exactly the same challenge um, that, you know, I, it might take an, a, an AI platform once it's developed only a few milliseconds to process each piece of data, but annotating it takes a long time, even in preparation for AI. So, I mean, I think um, bringing experts together to share the data they've collected fantastic but we need a, a kind of dedicated platform of um, citizen scientists perhaps people with expert knowledge to help us annotate those data and prepare them for AI um, so that it's really effective. I think the 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 labeling question is something that isn't that that people don't always consider when they think of ethical AI and or they think of how is the AI going to be developed um, maybe how much carbon does do these AI systems use? And then is it used for good? How is it going to, how can it be used for bad at the end? But they don't consider the front end of that, which is there needs to be a lot of data and it needs to be annotated well, like Philip was said, garbage in, garbage out. And, and so a lot of the questions that we get are, well, why is your annotation so expensive? Well, because we're not outsourcing it we're making sure that everyone who who annotates our data are properly trained, they are properly paid. They, you know, so so it really the, the whole AI question is much larger than um, you know, maybe the general public realizes. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think uh, it's a, it's a good point if anybody hasn't come across this when I was prepping for this conversation our uh, uh, machine learning PhD in residence uh, flag this up, which is on the topic of uh, annotation and labels, which is quite interesting. But, uh, you know, we wouldn't have been able to do what we did without open tools and open models. Like, there's no way, you know. Um, we may take credit for, like, a, a really beautiful-looking product and uh, making it really digestible for the public and a really fun thing. But like the hard work was kind of done for us. You know, we just picked up a thing and, you know, if you know a little bit of Python and K2 
can mess around with a Raspberry Pi. You can just about cobble together anything. But really, there's the, the heavy lifting is open. Um, is 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 what uh, uh, has already been done, and uh, the but yeah, it, you know, it like it needs to be a really collaborative process because it it's also quite easy to see how this technology that we are building and I, and I you know I didn't believe it. I just thought like, oh, this is Elon Musk being flippant, but this is like really powerful stuff, and it can really run away by itself. And uh, m more collaboration is, is, is very interesting. I had a, like, a quick question. Maybe it's not, uh, it doesn't um, return a quick answer, but if maybe, like, let's think about a timeline. Like, what was your on-ramp into the technology from thinking about it, oh, this could solve my problem, to getting to somewhere meaningful and says, ah, this has solved my problem. Like, how long was that process? I'm really curious about that, that from, from all of you. I, I wouldn't say that the process is solved. <laughs> I think, I think um, you know, as I mentioned, you know, everything is developing so quickly as well. So, so to really understand the, the, the problems and then you know, as we've all said, there it's AI alone isn't the answer. It's how the data are acquired, how they're labeled, how they're used. Because one of the things that I was frustrated with is that I, I, I spent a lot of time in academia and there were really powerful, brilliant things that were stained in academia. And and so, you know, I wanted to start my company because I wanted to find a way to make a difference. And the only way to do that is to get these powerful tools in the hands of as many people as possible. So that means it needs to be applicable, but it also needs to be accessible and people need to know about it and it needs to be demystified. So there's a lot of extra stuff in order for the AI to be useful. And there's a, a more communities. I, you know, I hope, I hope this is the beginning of a collaboration between the four of us in some way, you know? And I, and I would say, and Zoe, I think if you could mute again, I think, there we go. Um, I would say, take everything that you just said, Emily, and also flip it on its head and say, there are experts everywhere. And, and we think we're the experts, we're the only ones who can really do a lot of this. But, you know, if you look back at the, the climate paper uh, two years ago, and it was just an amateur mathematician in the UK who redid the analysis and found out that the analysis was slightly wrong and the paper was retracted. Um, I think that's what we're finding too. And this is why I think the, the Pokedex idea is so important is because we find that people have crazy levels of expertise that they just haven't applied. And if you can really get that out of the crowd, um, we can scale this up really quickly. But you know, thinking to, to your specific question, Filippo, everybody I've talked to has really who, who's been thinking about biodiversity, because it, there's so much complexity there, has realized the potential for AI um, quickly, but then pulling all the data together and solving some of the challenges of making it work has been much more difficult and complicated. And the deeper we get, the, the more challenges that we find. So if in analyzing your satellite data, you have pictures of people, then that triggers a whole different set of regulations about how you can use that data and what you can do with it. So, you know, the ethics and the legal parts of this, I think, are lagging the technology a little bit. Um, but everyone's sort of coming on board. And, and I mentioned earlier this UN decade of ocean sciences for sustainable development. The, the, the whole premise is behind that is that we need everybody working on these problems together, even people that never thought they were biodiversity scientist or ocean scientist. And so having you here is a really great example of just why that's so important. I, I, I sort of wanted to um, make a comment uh, to share with us all. And I told Caroline yesterday, and in relation to the biodiversity crisis, because it is a crisis and uh, um, you know, it's not that long that humankind has really, truly been able to 
figure out and realize the impact that we were having on this planet. It's not long at all, and it's, it's fairly recent that we've really started to, to take notice of it. Billions of people. And so I think as we go about solving these problems, I think we need to do it quickly. I think we need to do it collaboratively. Um, there's no other way. But I think that we also need to do it a little bit compassionately. I think as like a, a human species that's realized all of this harm that we've done, we also can't, we need to move quickly, but we can't be too hard on ourselves, right? Like we're realizing now what's happening and we should all like, you know, now there's no excuses not to try and do the right things and, uh, uh, and take the right actions. But, uh, you know, we should, again, we should have some self-compassion as we, as we figure out, yeah, you know, we, we messed up. Let's, let's go and fix it sort of thing. And a slightly different take on that, Filippo, is that if you look back at the history of fishing, people first started worrying about overfishing 150 years ago when small scale fishers, especially in the UK, were complaining about these larger trawlers. You know, they were sail powered trawlers, but they were worried. And people started talking then, this is going to happen. So we have all this historical data that can help us understand where we're going in the future, but we can't use that for AI right now because it's locked up in paper articles. And you know, sometimes it's been, been, been scanned. Um, but this is another place where now natural language processing, a form of AI, it could be really, really powerful because we can pull this kind of historical information out. Um, like it's a type of indigenous knowledge really and uh, it can inform the work we do as well. So yes, don't be, you know, it doesn't do us good to be too hard on ourselves, but let's realize that we've been changing the, the planet and at least the ocean for quite a long time now. Um, and we have a lot that we can learn from that. I would agree with that, Linwood. And I think that, you know, you mentioned traditional knowledge. I think we, we've done quite a lot of work with traditional um, ecological expert trackers. These people have a vast amount of expert knowledge and capability of interpreting earth signs, and they're not able to contribute that, right? There is no real platform for them to be able to contribute that data. And yet those people are kind of on the front line of a lot of our disappearing um, land life, possibly ocean life as well. Um, so, you know, and this goes back to what we've all been talking about, how to engage those people productively in moving forward, how to engage the right people and in the right way. On the other side of that coin, we have um, evidence, you know, in conservation biology that people are getting, for example, scraping geotags from images and using them to poach animals. Um, so, you know, we have to have, for endangered species, we have to have some kind of security around what we put out as well. So there's this constant interface between who should be doing what and where and to what extent. And I think, again, that's a bigger question than the AI technology in a way. And the technology is almost like the easy side. You know, the hard side is, is figuring out how to get that human interface right. And, and I think this is why it's so important that we, we look out to other examples of where information like this has been used and regulated. So if you think about weather data, terrorists can use weather data to plan attacks, but we still produce weather data. Um, and the same kind of fears were held about GPS. Uh, so we, we need to be really bold and move forward, but I think we need to bring the lawyers and the policy people and the ethicists along with us to solve those problems. Yeah, and, and I think this is this has a lot to do too with with not being afraid to move forward and innovate because someone might might weaponize what we're the, what what we're doing but we need to take that into consideration as we're moving forward so to make sure that we have data security people and cybersecurity people moving forward in tangent with us and that we don't just go alone sort of you know as cowboys into the into the wild west, but that it, it, it's it's really important for all the disciplines to move forward together in order to to innovate and, and to really be cutting edge together. Thank you, thank you guys for this uh, super interesting conversation that you sharing with us. I think we're gonna spend the last five minutes to answer the questions. Uh, so 
first question we have for Zoe. Thanks, Zoe, for this wonderful insight. Could you please highlight more on individuals of same species distribution through the footprint identification? How would you differentiate it? You mute, you mute. Can you unmute? I'm sorry. So if I understand the question correctly, um, you're asking how, how we use the footprint identification technique to identify individuals. Is that right? Um, so, so basically, each, I mean, a footprint is a complicated thing, right? It's not like a human fingerprint, because every time an animal puts its foot on the ground, you get a unique signal. You know, a human fingerprint dabbed on 10 pieces of paper, you'd expect the same fingerprint. But footprints are unique. So to characterize an individual from a footprint, we need to take many footprints along a trail, perhaps six to eight different footprints. Um, and we take the dimensions of each of those footprints, or if it's going through AI, we'll put all of them through the AI system. Um, and those footprints together kind of form a kind of a profile of that individual. Um, for species identification, you can simply take a single footprint sometimes, and that'll tell you which the species is, or most often an expert tracker could tell you that too. Um, so individual identification is, is challenging. It also depends on, on the substrate. If you put your foot in a, a sand pit compared with a mud, a mud pile, you'll get two slightly different profiles. So we also need to include substrate in our, um, in our system. Thank you, Zoe. Then we have a question from Libo for Linwood. Uh, thanks for the presentation. Uh, how accessible is the data to use the working to promote awareness and accountability? And I'll, I'll say my, my colleague, Sandra Seppala, has answered Libo in, in the Q&A that the Ocean Data Platform is still in development phase. And so the public preview hopefully will be in, in the next six months or so. But the idea is that um, to make these data available so people can get in and get them, um, make them open. And then what we really want is people to create apps within the platform and share the code for the apps. So when Filippo is doing this, we might find that, well, the code that he's using for this might be applicable to something else in, in our work that uh, a human ecosystem that goes with the data, I think it's important. Thanks so much, Linwood. Then we have a question for Emily. What role do you foresee for marine biologists if AI starts doing their job more efficiently? Would their work be phased out? Uh, no, they. I don't think they'll ever be uh, missing missing out on any any work. the The work is is so nuanced and it's so subtle. What and you know they're human beings as well, so they can't see in the dark. They can't. Uh, they get tired. They get tired after lunch. Um, but we really need experts to make expert calls. They maybe don't need to be doing the 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 really mundane blah work and so what what we're developing is a human in the loop tool where it's just those edge cases that the human annotates and then it retrains the ai to recognize those edge cases of is this a whale is this not a whale is no it's actually a seal or a walrus so so the the humans are are very important part of this and we see ai as a way to create like super marine biologists as opposed to replacing them entirely thank you um a final question because i think for the other questions your colleagues have been able to answer thanks so much for for this um the fi final question how technology will be helping combat against illegal wildlife trade from such innovations? It's true that this is also an entire topic that we could have spent one hour talking on this. Anyone want to try answering this? Yes, no? Well, I'll just <laughs> mention, I think where the, the frontier is is with, with, is with DNA. And so in, in the environmental realm, we're using environmental DNA to understand where biodiversity is and where animals are. But that DNA is like is essentially a barcode for animals. And really, when illegal wildlife gets to the consumer, um, it's very difficult to know that, that it was illegally traded. And, and so DNA is what's going to unlock that. But now, 
if you imagine how complicated it is to analyze images or footprints, imagine how complicated it is to imagine to analyze DNA at a global scale on a species by species basis on an individual by individual basis. But I think there is a, a lot of potential um, in, in combining AI with DNA and molecular techniques. Anyone else? Well, thanks so much, Lynn Wood. Uh, we're right on time. So I want to thank all of you for this super interesting uh, conversation. Um, I feel uh, a bit relieved to see that so many great people, smart people are so engaged and committed to uh, protect our, our super beautiful biodiversity. Um, I, I, I must also say that it was interesting to have one talk about AI with people that are basically no computer scientists, no data scientists. You are vet, you are biologists, you are creative designer in technology. This is also showing that anyone basically can use this, uh, this AI technology to to make the make the dream of the the job of their dream and, and try to have an impact. So um, this say so. I want to thank everyone for joining. Um, I'm just going to share a few last information uh, concerning our next event, and um, here we are. So we're going to have our next Parisat chat on May 27 about the digital identity challenge. Uh, please follow us on LinkedIn and subscribe to our newsletter so you'll get information about timing and uh, some registration access. And for any of you having a, a great project, having a, a, an AI company, an AI startup, or simply being a, uh, um, studying AI and, and have a, a, lot, a lot of great ideas to help deliver on the sustainable development goals, you're welcome to apply to join the Good AI community um, directly on our website, the Good AI. Dot co. Thank you so much, everyone. I wish you a very nice evening or a very nice day, and I hope to see you very, very soon. Thank you very much. Bye, Linwood. Bye, Filippo. Bye, bye Emily. Bye, Zoe. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, everybody who watched and tuned in and asked questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Bye-bye.